So somebody shout, day seven. Day seven. Come on, look at somebody and say, this is day seven. day seven. See, if you're visiting, and we've been on a seven-day consecration fast. The Lord had me call it the crossover fast. So you heard me talking early, and you didn't have a clue what I was talking about. It's okay. Literally for seven days, we have been focusing and fasting and denying our flesh. And our main text really has been what Joshua said, sanctify yourselves. I believe Joshua 3.5, he says, for the Lord will work wonders among you. Amen. So our focus of sanctifying and consecrating. What does consecrate mean, Pastor? To separate for special use and purpose. How many know people, before they go to the MBA, many of them go to training camps. When they have been groomed and selected, many of us don't know this, you're almost, it's almost a shoe-in that you're going to go to the league once you go to these overseas camps. How many of you know about this? They start grooming you and preparing you. It happens in every sector and every field. Why? Because they're preparing them to enter from one realm to the next realm. I believe God is consecrating Ark City Church because he's bringing us to a new land and a new place. And I'm telling you, record-breaking sowing into our capital campaign. There are pastors and leaders who will get involved. I really want to admonish you to jump in on this. God's going to bless you because we're going to get a new place and location. I'm telling you, conferences, more prayer, things that we want to do that we've been limited to do is going to be phenomenal. Greater facilities and rooms and access for our children, for our seminars, trainings, classes. Amen. Healing schools, prayer schools. Come on, son. I can't wait. Amen. Praise God. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be awesome. But I just want to review these super fast for you. The seven-day uh, devotional, if you text fast to that number, you should have gotten a seven-day devotional. And the seven-day, the day one was from Acacia to the crossing. And we literally took that from Joshua 3.1, and we talked about how God had them sitting in a place called Shatim, which is the Acacia Grove. It's an impervious, impenetrable tree to fire and to frost. And it represented that God allows the dry place to deplete dead religious routine so that it gets our attention to press toward freshness and also because he's, gonna, he's about to shift us. And so we moved from that moment. And then we went to day two was our journey to the Jordan. And every night we've had prayer calls. Every single night at 9 o'clock except for Friday night, we had in-person prayer. How many of y'all were blessed by in-person prayer? <laughs> Y'all, this room, let me tell you, that's another thing we, for, we, we forgot to say. This was the first time we had as many, well, not today, we're packed out today, but this was the first time, generally, or generally speaking, that we had as many people in prayer as we would on a Sunday morning. We broke another record. Come on. Somebody shout crossover. I want to personally say how proud I am of every one of you. I'm proud of you. Some of you say, Pastor, I have never in my life gone past even a meal or a day fasting, and you finished and completed. Put your hands together for everyone. I want y'all to praise God for you. That's the best you can do for you? You don't celebrate you. Who going to celebrate you? Give yourself a standing ovation. Amen. I'm proud of you. Me and Minnesota, she are so proud of you. You denied your flesh, you followed fully, and everything we've been preaching, we have watched you put feet to faith on those teachings. I'm telling you what, you don't always see the effects of a fast immediately in the fast, but you watch the next ensuing days and weeks and, and month or two. Watch what God does because he's a God who constantly uses reward and incentive. God wants, God wants to bless you so that you say, man, I'm about to fast some more. I'm about to seek his face some more. That's the kind of God we serve. He wants to incentivize you into obedience. Say amen. amen. So we went from journeying to our Jordan from Joshua 3 and 2. Then day 3, we followed to new frontiers. That was Joshua 3 and 3, learning how to embrace the new and the unknown. How many of you have been really pressing into these moments of prayer? Then day 4 was keeping our eyes on the ark and our priests. So that rep the ark does represent the goal of what God's building in our house, but also it represents cleansing the ark of your body temple so God's presence and power can be exuded in a greater dimension. And so we the day 4 was keeping your eyes on the ark and your priests, and that was really learning on how to honor and practice spiritual distancing and how in our culture we've lost our reverence. We've lost the fear of the Lord, and many don't realize part of miracles and wonders is getting back to the fear of God. The scripture says in Isaiah 11 that there are seven manifestations.
There are seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. These Apple watches are bogus. You know that, right? Anytime you, you lift it up, can you help me? She'll never help you. But when you ain't even trying to talk or say nothing, she just, what'd you say? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, all right. So, uh, <laughs> I cannot stand that, y'all. I'm about to get the bootleg. I'm about to get the peach watch. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Applejack watch. <laughs> In our culture, God showed me years ago, he said, son, if my people would get more respect, put more respect on my name and my order, the oil would flow more consistently in their life. It's not even about how sinless and perfect you are. Put some respect on the things of God. Respect the people God says to respect. Order, respect the order God puts in place. You can never go wrong if you don't know what to do. If you say, I'm going to go by way of honor and order. God will bless you. Do you understand? And so God, in this, in this passage in Joshua 4, he said, I want you to follow the priests and follow the ark, but keep a safe distance. And that's a lot. See, familiarity as a sin, the root of familiarity is the root family. And the more close you get with people that you see their idiosyncrasies, even their sins or their flaws, the more you will judge and think you know somebody after the flesh. But the Bible says, judge no man after the flesh. And so as we sanctify, as we consecrate, part of that is getting back to being respectful to the things of God. Amen. You shouldn't be in here complaining because, you know, worship was 30 minutes instead of 10 like you're used to. Or, you know, I'm telling you, all these small things we do are so irreverent. But if, it was, but if it was Bill Gates or it was somebody with wealth or Warren Buffett, you know, you'd sit there for seven hours milking that brother dry for the wisdom he has. But we'll literally have a cop and attitude because we're in the house of God and worship went longer or a message wasn't a 15 te minute TED talk. People of God, we want God, we want to reverence God and respect him to such a place where God says, there's nothing that I will not do to help and intervene on your behalf. Your business, what do you need? We want to be that kind of leader. See, what caused Solomon, God to appear to Solomon in a dream, was not that he simply gave a burnt offering. The Bible actually says that he was burning, killing, he was sacrificing thousands of animals because he thought that was giving his greatest and best to God, and God saw Solomon's heart. And Solomon was just a teenager. And God appeared to him, and look what God says to him. Ask of me what you want me to do for you. You know how you got to touch God, where he sees what Solomon did was an act of respect and reverence to his name, and God appears to him in a dream and said, boy, what you want? <laughs> how many of you want a boy, what you want moment from God Almighty? Woo, wave your hand at me in this place. Don't lie in here. That's exactly what you want. Amen. I tell people, don't be embarrassed about wanting God to bless your finances or your health or your marriage or your home. God wants you seeking him for those things, not Satan and witchcraft and the occult. Amen. Amen. That's a power principle for moving in miracles. Walk in the fear of God. Watch your mouth. Watch the things you say. Amen. And God will consecrate your lips and your hands and move with power through you. Amen. Amen. Then the next day was sanctify and consecrate for the Lord shall work wonders, which I'm kind of speaking about right now. Just consecrating our homes, consecrating our hearts. Amen. I actually think I skipped one, didn't I? Uh, yes. You know what? On day two, we talked about establishing a new base camp. I don't want to skip that. About how many of you have done well with really resetting your prayer times, your worship time, your study time at home with your kids? Wave your hand at me. No condemnation, but some of you, how many of you say, Pastor, I still want to work on that. Put your hand up. It's okay. Amen. God sees your heart. Amen. I'm proud of you. All right. So the Lord wants to work wonders. And I'm really believing this next season, God is going to move with tremendous signs and wonders through your hands, through your prayers. How many of you say, Pastor, I want that desperately? God wants to use you. He doesn't want to just use preachers. He wants to use you. He wants to move in power through you. The last one, and I'm actually going to teach into the, or day six says, take up the ark and lead the people. Notice that in Joshua 3, 6, 7 through 8, not only did they have to leave what was comfortable, leave what was convenient, they had to set out and follow 
the ark and follow their priesthood. And God spoke to me about how he's raising a new wave of refreshing and leadership in our church. I'm, we're watching God already do some amazing things with a lot of you. There's leadership on your life. There's a grace to leave and a grace to lead. You're like Genesis 12, God told Abraham, get up from your country, from what's familiar. He said, and leave your relatives and go to the land that I will show you. God is causing you to leave old lifestyles, leave old mentalities, leave old uh, seasons where you lack tremendous spiritual discipline. And God is saying, I'm never going to lead you to leave something and not cause you to lead into the next and promote you into, into leading what I have for you in the future. Say amen. Now, day seven, we're going to teach a little bit today. The focus for today was today I will drive out your enemies from before you. I want to hear the whole room say this with me. Say, today God will drive out my enemies from before me. See, the world thinks a hater is somebody who critiques you as a Christian and says you should be living what you're preaching. That ain't a hater. That's a friend. Your hater is unseen. He's a diabolical, unseen, unclean spirit that moves with unclean demon demons that are constantly trying to sabotage you and set you up in cycles and remove the blessing off your life. How? By self-sabotage, by sowing into sin, sowing into your flesh, sowing or marrying the ideals and the emotionalism of the world. Satan is your number one hater. Did you hear? Not people. Satan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there may be people who, you know, but a lot of times that's the enemy moving on others to try to re resist you. And the Bible says if you're going to be mature and grow up and be spiritual, you got to look at the spirit behind something. You got to talk to the spirit behind an individual. There may be, you may be dealing with tremendous targeting and, and, and attacks on your job. Don't get there and argue with your boss. Speak to that spirit. Say, Satan, I see you. You shall not dispossess anything that pertains to my household. The blood of Jesus is around every aspect of my resume, my employment, my, 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 uh, my tenure. In the name of Jesus, I shall not be removed. Do you learn to talk right? Heaven will back you up. Angels will start walking and clocking in <laughs> on your job. I've been sent by Jehovah. I'm coming to clean some stuff up in here today. Learn your authority. Kings don't run around in the mud. Kings make decrees and release their spoken word. And they believe what they say will go before them. The Lord spoke on day seven, and I believe this is apropos to us praying for the sick today and anointing you here shortly. We are going to drive, and the, and the enemies God is going to drive out are the demons, diseases, depravity, sin, sickness, and Satan. It is going to be broken off your life today. God is the God who told Joshua. Turn to Joshua chapter 3. We're going to end with these last few portions of verses, and then we're going to move on next week to something new. Praise the name of the Lord. I believe 100% that we will be kicking off our Family Matters series next week in the name of Jesus. Joshua chapter 3. Turn there very quickly. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'll be reading from the AMPC if you're looking on your devices want to remind you, we are reading through the Bible as a church family. And man, let me tell you, haven't these portions of Scripture we've been reading confirmed what we've been preaching and what we've been studying? Isn't it been amazing? The things that Jesus is teaching and talking, it's incredible. And, and we're advising you, make comments on that. Amen. I've been doing commentary. Why? We need you to learn to study the Bible. It can't just be a Sunday experience. you got to learn to do this. Daily disciplines every single day. Amen. So in Joshua chapter 3, I'm reading from the AMPC. Let's start now on verse, let's start on verse uh, 9. It says, and Joshua said to the Israelites, come near and hear the words of the Lord your God. This is the portion we'll be exegeting today. Come near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, hereby shall you know that the living God is among you. Here we go. And that he will surely drive out. Somebody shout, drive out. Drive out. Look, somebody say, drive out. drive out. He shall drive out from before you the Canaanites, 
the Hittites, the Habites, the Parasites. I believe real parasites, paranormal parasites are coming out today in Jesus' name. Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. For behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, I want you to see this powerful premise right here. Right before they passed the Jordan crossing, right before they passed it, they dealt, God warned them, my God, he warned them about attacks that could ensue against them. And he warned them about seven people groups, seven people groups that would come and attack them. But before we get to that, I want you to see this. Once everybody was in proper position, once the people were moving out of the base camp, once they were obedient to keep their eyes on the ark, once they were obedient to keep their eyes on the priests, once that this warning came forth, I want you to see something. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But I want you to see that the Bible says in verse, what the Bible says here in verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. And Joshua began to speak. And God spoke to me that as I was studying and preparing this, he said, when my people sanctify and consecrate, notice that Joshua began to speak. So he spoke of the officers making moves in the congregation. Then he spoke of the Levitical priests getting into formation and into position. Then the Bible says their leader, Joshua, opened his mouth and began to say something from the Lord. Here's what I want to tell you God put on my heart. He said, when this church has consecrated and fasted and separated unto me, that he told me that Joshua, which really is the Hebrew for Yeshua. If you don't know the word, the name Joshua in Hebrew is really pronounced Yeshua. And in the Greek, Joshua becomes Jesus. Did you know that Jesus' name in Hebrew is really Joshua? Many Christians don't know that. Yeshua. Yeshua. So God spoke to me and he said this, son, when my people obey and get in order and follow and consecrate and sanctify, I will speak a fresh word as their high priest. I will speak a fresh word to this congregation, and I will talk clearly to them because God only follows and anoints his order. See, after the sifting, after the sitting, after the seemingly stagnant, after the reorganization of your home camp, your base camp, fresh orders that came to individuals to refocus. Refocus on the purpose of why I put you here. Refocus on my power, not your own power. These are all the things we saw in all of the ensuing verses. Return to reverence, right? Keep the why and the vision. Follow the priestly leaders. Then the word of the Lord came mightily through Joshua. And it is a picture of Yeshua himself speaking to our congregation. Somebody say sanctify. Now, the word, I want to be clear, sanctify means to set apart from profane and secular use to a holy one, to remove contamination, to take out mixture and influence. I'm going to say it again. To set apart from what is profane or secular to a holy purpose, to remove contamination, to be unmixed from, uh, from uh, unclean influences. It requires an inward turning and an outward removal of what defiles. I'm going to say that again. It requires an inward turning and an outward removal of what defiles. The Lord spoke through Joshua. And in verse 7, he says, This day I will begin to magnify and exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, so that you may know that just as I was with Moses, I will also be with you. You shall command the priests. They shall carry the ark. And the Lord is speaking right now a new anointing of the priesthood and the kingship coming in this house. A new anointing that comes upon you to carry what you couldn't sustain. A new weight of glory rising upon you. A new oil on your head to walk as priests and priestesses, as as kings, as queens, because the hour demands it. And this is the moment. This is the moment we've been leading to. When Joshua finally adds the word, when there's a spoken word, when there is a rhema, when there is a living word from Jesus, then the miracles, the parting of the waters, the parting of the obstacles, the parting of the opposition, the parting of everything that would try to obstruct them was moved miraculously. 
Somebody say, Yeshua, speak to this congregation. Hallelujah. And once the word of the Lord spoke, God said something specific. When he spoke, when God, now the picture here is God the Father speaks to Joshua. And the picture, the typology I see is God the Father releases Jesus, Yeshua, to speak. And the thing that he spoke out of his mouth that was so powerful in verse 9 or in, in verse 10 is he said, now I'm going to start driving these things out. I'm driving out these issues. I'm driving out these devils, these dysfunctions, these broken, these layers of brokenness and trauma. This shall no longer trip you up. I'm sabotaging your cycles. I'm shutting down the source of it. I'm bankrupting the brokenness. I'm sh hey! once, once Joshua spoke, God through his mouth said, I see the unseen enemies. The unclean things in your mind. See, you've done what you can in your human flesh. You've done what you can in the natural. You have drew near to God, and the Bible promises that he would draw near to you. The scripture said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from the wicked way, then I, 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 then you release me. Then you untie my hands. Then I can do divine intervention because first you must obey. That's exactly what I believe is going to happen right now and is happening in this room. That Yeshua is speaking and what you could not see in the natural, what you could not detect or discern supernaturally, that Jehovah God, the son of the living God, Yeshua, our Joshua, our high priest, our leader is here today and his mouth is open and he is enunciating and he is speaking and saying, thus says the Lord, this day, somebody shout this day. I will, not I might, not I hope, I will drive out. Seven is the number of perfection, which means God will give you perfect wholeness, perfect deliverance, perfect freedom, perfect, perfect, perfect. Seven people groups that would try to harass and harangue. And how many of us have dealt with multiple issues, multiple things, one side addiction, one side anger, one side lust, one demon of people group of one parasite on one side, a Hittite on the other, a Jebusite on the right. Come on. Feeling like we've been surrounded by the ites. Here's the word of the Lord to you. Today the Lord smites your ites. The word of the Lord to you today is the Lord shall smite the ites. Pastor, what's the ites? All them ites. The termites, the parasites, the Hittites. See, everyone, <laughs> every one of those people groups, I can't preach it today. Every one of those people groups represent a different demonic stratagem to try to shut down through intimidation, intimidation, fear, sexual sin, rejection, hopelessness. Every one of those groups. It was not a coincidence that these seven groups were mentioned and, G and Joshua said, and, the, and God spoke through Joshua and said, I got them. You do what I told you to do and obey the covenant. Get your tail up and march and break this camp down and move and follow your leaders and keep your eyes on the ark of my covenant, my word, my spirit, and your leadership. He said, because I'm coming now. And I'm going to drive out every unclean Amorite, every Hivite, every Gergesh, every Jebusite. Boy, we could preach eight weeks if we break down the meaning of each one of the names of these people. And how many, one of them represents the flesh. See, the Amalekites, one of the ites, there's multiple ites, but the Amalekites were one of these Canaanite cultural people. And God told Saul, King Saul, to destroy all the Amalekites, and he disobeyed. And you know who ended up, who ended up killing King Saul in the end? An Amalekite. And the Amalekite represents your flesh. And here is the biblical principle. If you will not kill those issues in your flesh, Satan will allow it to secretly be watered and cultivated until one day it's bigger than you can handle and it tries to come back and kill you. But today the Lord says, I will smite the ites from among my people. I will smite. And I, smite means to cut, to kill, to slap. I, somebody shout, smite the ites. Come on, shout it louder. Smite the ites. 
He's going to smite every ite in your life. God said, I'm about to fight for this people. And I will begin to magnify, this is what I heard the Lord say, I'm going to begin to magnify the faithful in Ark City Church who have followed through the dark nights, through the three-day moments of stagnation, who have kept focus on priests and leadership, have kept proper position, and the faithful ones among you. God said, I am going to fight your battles. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord. God said, I'm going to fight them unclean spirits. You have been trying to counsel it out. You, oh, you have been trying to dwine it and die it out. You have been trying to coddle it out with your cousins and your relatives. You have been trying to do natural things with your husband or your wife or your job situation. God said, no, there's spirits involved here. There's unclean things behind the scenes. God said, I'm going to empower you to see. You will begin to discern through the discerning of my spirit and see in the spiritual realm the true enemies behind every assault and every attack in your life. Because your Yeshua has spoken. He didn't say they're going to smite you. He said, no, you're going to take them out. You're going to mow them down. Cut them down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God told me he's raising up the judges in this hour. And I believe I'm looking at a room full of judges, supernatural judges, rising up who are unorthodox, outside of what modern cute Christianity expects. But God said, I'm about to raise a warrior class of priests. I'm about to raise up a warrior class of priests who will fight, but this shall be the hour of the bride. Hallelujah. Somebody shout ascension. Guess what that means? In this hour, as God unveils and exposes you to greater dimensions of discipline and, and power, he's going to raise us up together. See, ascension means God's not just going to raise up one or other in the sense of opening, the, of swinging wide an open door of opportunity for you to come up higher. God is saying, I've flung the door wide open to Ark City Church for every one of you to make a decision to leave and to move spiritually. See, I preached a whole year, didn't even know it was culminating to this, on growing up spiritually. The entire focus from the pastoral side, not the prophetic side, has been grow, growing up. Growing up in character. Growing up in spiritual maturity. God gave us a year to get our hearts and our minds right and deal with these soils because God knew we were coming to a place where he would speak the word of the Lord that it's time to cross. And isn't that just like God? Because in this pa pa uh, passage... He allowed the shatim, he allowed the acacia, and he allowed the, the three nights to let them consecrate. That's what all this year has been, a three-night moment of consecration. And guess what? Those who will not consecrate were left behind. Those who did consecrate followed the word of the Lord. Amen. God said, I'm demonstrating something fresh and new among you. He drives out your Canaanites. He drives out these issues. Deuteronomy 7 and 1, look what God says. Put it on the screen. Just another reminder. It says, for when the Lord your God brings you into the land, say the land, where you are entering in to possess it. Notice, not to partake, to possess. Not to partake, to take over. Say, we're not here to partake. We're here to take over. Come on, shout the takeover, because that's what it is, y'all. It's a takeover. God wants his children at the highest realms and levels of influence in every sphere of society and culture. And many of you have unique callings, some into education, entertainment, some into entrepreneurship, uh, some into ministry, multiple. And God is saying, I got to mature you and grow you. And you got to deal with these issues, and I'm going to smite these ites in your life because I need to see you possess the land that I've called you to, to take over and rout out devils and push out these principalities. Say amen. God said you're going to possess it. And I'll clear away the nations from before you. He said it again. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, Canaanites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations. Look what he says here. That are greater and stronger than you. 
Why would God say something like that in Deuteronomy 7? Why would he say that they're mightier and greater? Because he doesn't want you putting your strength in the arm of flesh. He doesn't want you to think it was your education. And your, come on and talk to me. Your resume, your background, your creative, I'm a creator, your creative ability. No, God wants to show you that it is by the power of the voice of your Joshua that drives out these opponents from your life. What are your ites? What are the types of your ites? Is it fear? Is it sexual sin? Is it depression? Is it rejection? Is it intimidation? Is it poverty? Is it, see, many have the fear of success. Some have the fear of failure. God says, before I can cause you to look at these giants like David and take its head off, you got to know what these ites are and how they will try to intimidate you. Because God said, I'm giving you power to overcome them. I'm giving you power. Notice, God used them to drive it out. It wasn't that God just appeared on a chariot and he just started kicking. He, he gave them strategy. He spoke through their Joshua, through their priests. He trained them. There was a whole system there. And God said, one, one group at a time, we're going we gonna to wipe them out. We're going to take out all opposition from the land. See, Satan will put giants around your destiny. He will, he will put ops and implant intimidation from your childhood and your past around you. So every time you get close to the border of your limitation and what you think you couldn't do, that he puts ites all around you. The ite of fear, the ite of intimidation, the ite of self-doubt, the ite of hope of hopelessness. Well, my mama didn't do it. My daddy couldn't do it. How could I do it? But you're not your mama. You're not your daddy. You are, you are the seed of Abraham. You have been reconnected. You are in the downline of Jesus Christ. You have the God genes inside of you. You have Christ chromosomes in your veins. You are a different, you are a new creation in Christ. God wants to raise you up to break records, break, to be a record breaker, a nation shaker. God wants you to do something different. But what Satan does, like he did with the nation of Israel, is he plants giants and puts ites all around you. And the question is, what are your ites? Is it money? Is it greed? Is it covetousness? Is it recreation? Is it, is it vacation? <laughs> because Joshua is coming for your eyes. I said, King Joshua, King Yeshua is coming for your eyes. He's not coming to cohabitate with your eyes. He's coming to kill your eyes. He's coming to slay those eyes. He wants those eyes out of your system. He wants them out of your bank account. He wants them out of your bedroom. It's quiet in here. See, Satan fights the hardest when you're the closest. Right when they cross, he says, get ready. There's seven people groups that are going to come against you. But I'm telling you right now, you're going to have the victory. See, aren't you glad about God? God? See, people think, well, you know, we're crossing over. Praise God. And God says, get ready to fight. Now, you're going to win. But you're not going to just stand there. You're going to sharpen your sword. We're going to master the swordsmanship. You're going to watch this. And mastering swordsmanship is knowing how to, how to recite scripture and how to declare it against demons and dysfunction and spiritual situations. God's going to allow situations to sharpen your sword. He's going to let you wet your, the tip of your sword in the blood of your enemies. And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about your own sins, your own insecurities, your own idiosyncrasy. The first enemy you got to kill is inner me. Your first enemy is inner me. There are inner issues and inner things. And God says, pull that sword of the spirit, according to Ephesians 6, 17. For the sword that the spirit wields is the word of God. See, you can't conquer. You can't See, more than a conqueror is when God begins to move you to possess things outwardly. But to be a conqueror means you got to conquer carnality first. Conquer issues and the works of your flesh. Conquer lust. Let me tell you, I almost blacked out. I was making, uh, my, you know, last week my, we were in this fast, and my wife uh, bought pizza for the kids. Uh, let me tell you something right now. Now, you know, your pastor's from New York, and I love me some New York pizza. You know, and this is a pretty good restaurant. And so um, no one was around. And, uh, and so it's just me and the Leia. And uh, man, let me tell you what, I, I usually don't struggle like this. But, 
But I knew it was the principle of the matter. See, in this fast, it's very easy. If you be tell the truth, your flesh tried to cheat many times. Well, it ain't white bread, it's just wheat bread. We said no bread. Where did it say just wheat bread? You see, but this is what our flesh does. Huh? My wife bought me a salad. She forgot to take the bacon off the salad. I was tasting the hickory smoke on the leaves. I said I was tasting the hickory smoke on the leafuses. I said, I said, Lord Jesus, this woman, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> I hate the flesh. Look. And so literally, I'm telling you, I was sweating bullets. I was like, and then I had cut them to these tiny, small, little pieces. And so my flesh said, it's not a whole pizza. Watch this. There was a couple of times where I was like, you know, I got to try this to make sure it ain't bad for I feed the kids. You know, that's rough on a fast as a parent, right? See, y'all who don't have kids, you don't know how rough that is. You're like, I need to know if this cream of wheat is too hot. I need to know, because I was fast the majority and eating one, one meal a day and sometimes, sometimes none. And my flesh is going through, but man, I, I put that pizza in the air fryer. You know, the air fryer take old pizza and make it brand new. The orange anointing oil was dripping and seeping out onto the, onto the wooden bed. Pastor, don't worry. At the end of service, you... <laughs> and let me tell you something more. I literally was like... I'm taking that little tiny piece right there and putting it right in my mouth. And I'm going to suck on that little piece of pizza like it was a lozenge. You ain't talking to me. Like, I'm going to milk that piece of white succulent bread with that orange oil. And look at y'all. Your flesh ain't making it right now. You're like, Pastor, quit it. This is good for you right here. Do you know? You know how you know you're free? Go grocery shopping while you're fasting. That's when you know you're free. And don't overspend. <laughs> you know, the main rule with shopping is you never grocery shop when you're hungry. Man, I would challenge my flesh, and I still do that. I would go shopping hungry. I would push my flesh. And you know what I said to myself? You, you know, this can be real for some of y'all. You know what I said to myself? I'm going to tell you exactly what I said. Because this how, Pastor, you talk to yourself? This, absolutely. I said, what if that was a woman who in the world was, you know, in the world you got all these fleshly things. So what if that was a woman who was soliciting me sexually right now in front of me? And I had a decision to make to commit adultery on my wife, lose my family, or indulge in this right here. I was sweating over a piece of pizza. I said, man, sweating over a piece of pizza. There's some pizza, some some, some, shim-shims out here in the world. There's some other pieces out here. Side pieces. And boy, oh boy, I said, I, and then I said, what if, what if this was an opportunity because of greed to do something illegal, make a lot of money? And this is it right here. And this right, nobody will see. It's just me. And I was thinking this. I said, I'll be doggone. And it, it stopped me because I'm telling you I was going to do it. <laughs> Oh, my God. I told my wife last night, man, I got a confession. Said, man, what'd you do? I almost ate this pizza. <laughs> Demons just coming out. How have you had moments like this during the fact, and you learn some stuff about your flesh? Put your hand up. You learn some stuff. And this is why we have fallen when we have had unclean solicitations. But if you can say no to the hunger, the body's dry for hunger, you can shut down every other form of hunger. I would, I would admonish you to fast. If you can, some of you, this is a lot for you, but you ain't got to do long fast. You can actually do a day fast. You can fast a meal. People always want to do these huge spiritual insurmountable, like, they want to they climb spiritual Mount Everest on day one. Why don't you fast breakfast one day a week? And during breakfast, I refuse to be distracted. I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray during breakfast. And that's it. I will not be distracted. You know, God will honor that. You know, God will say, that is a fast before me. 
God will honor that. And you can't deny your flesh and not access greater blessing from the Spirit. Greater power. Amen. Oh, I talk like that to myself. I'm gangster with myself. I'm gutter. I say the craziest thing you could possibly think. I say to myself, I say, oh, we're not doing that. We're not getting into that. Oh, no, we're not. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my church. Look, I love y'all. I'm not putting y'all on the shame show. I'm tired of folk putting the church on the shame show. We're going to need real men who could turn it down to say, no, thank you. You see, and then God wants to raise you around political leaders and senators, and God's been doing that with me. And do you know all that stuff where I have not, I had to secretly not eat my own tithe and give above, and then God challenges me to give beyond y'all because I'm the pastor. I need to be above y'all. Give double that. I ain't rich. You think we rich? We ain't rich. We're just real good budgeters with our money. We're not rich. And God, somebody shout leadership. leadership. God has called every one of you to the same standard of leadership. All right. We're going to close out here in just a moment. But here's the one thing I want you to, I want you to turn in this last scripture, 1 Timothy 6.12. And I want this to set us up before we begin to minister to the sick. Come up here, Jeremy. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Somebody say, my faith is worth fighting for. My faith is worth fighting for. God said, I'm going to drive out your enemies. God is going to deal with these ites in your life. And I believe today is it going to be a hallmark moment. This is going to be a game changer for you today. Because, yes, God can deliver. God can drive out demonic influence, and God can give you a fresh start, but it does not end there. You have to obey the Word of God. You have to do what the Scripture teaches, or you will invite those oppressions back. But I believe today, you're, as the power of God is administered to your body, as we begin to lay hands and anoint people today, I believe God is going to do something remarkable. I want you to pass out the elements very quickly all over this room. Let me, let's get our communion elements together, and I want you to distribute them. My leaders, start distributing the communion elements. We are going to take communion as a spiritual family to close and culminate this fast. And one of the, as we do this, I believe the power of God's already going to start moving in your body. Because the broken body and the blood signify your healing covenant. As they're distributing the elements, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, I want you to turn there very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Say, my faith is worth fighting for. Now, why are you saying that, Pastor? Because God said, as he drives out your enemies today, He's going to use you, that it's a partnership between you and him, and that the power of God is going to come and touch your body today. And I believe miracles are going to happen all over this room. Miracles can be instantaneous, but healings can happen immediately, but within moments. Some of you will get prayed for today, and you may receive the manifestation later on in your home. You may sense that a gradual lifting of certain pains and things in your body. All you have to do today is praise God and believe that you receive. You don't earn the miracle. Jesus already purchased healing on the cross. And the same way you heard Jesus was your Savior, and you put your faith in the gospel, and you believed, and you received your salvation, it's the same way you receive Jesus as your healer. You must accept Jesus not just as your Savior. I'm I'm about to give you a revelation you must accept Jesus as your healer and how do you do that pastor the same way you receive Jesus as your Savior you accept you hear what the word says about healing you accept it by faith and you receive Jesus as your healer and the healing power of God is administered to your body you don't have to feel it you just simply must believe first Timothy 6 and 12 says this 
it says, verse 11, let's start there. It says, but for you, O man of God, flee from all these things. Aim and pursue righteousness, right standing with God and true goodness and godliness, which is the loving fear of God and being Christ-like, faith, love, steadfast patience and gentleness of heart. Watch this, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Watch this. Lay hold. This is what you're about to do today as we pray for you. Lay hold of eternal life which you were summoned and which you confess with a good confession before many witnesses. The word lay hold, people of God. Let me say this to you. God wants you to experience his best. Do you believe that God wants you to have the best? Put your hand up. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you as a mother or a father or a future mother or father, you would die for your kids. You literally would do whatever you could to give them the best. Put your hand up. Would you ever be jealous or mad if they got a bigger house than you as a father or a mother? Or as they grew up, they were more financially successful? Than, or would you just be even more proud and happy because they're your children? Yes? The Bible says in Luke 11, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him. Healing, deliverance is a good thing. None of us would want our kids oppressed. None of us would want our kids dealing with drug addiction. None of us would want our kids dealing with pain that they can't even sit in a chair or they can't enjoy. They're dealing with discomfort. Jesus died on the cross not just for your sins. He died on the cross for your sicknesses, for your pains. Isaiah 53 and 4 says, He bore our pains and carried our sorrows. Jesus died for any pain. If it's a pain in your body, Jesus died for it. Is that migraine pain? Is a sprained ankle pain? Is a hangnail pain? Then Jesus died for it. He doesn't want you to experience it or to have it. But this is what you must do today. You must fight the good fight. Why is it good? Because you, Jesus already won it. It has been fixed. And the fight that you fight is simply believing that it is done. It is finished. And I accept it. Jesus is the true warrior. He already decapitated the giant of disease, the giant of sickness and sin. All he tells you to do is believe it and act like it. Ephesians 3, 1, 1 and 3 says, You have been blessed in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with all spiritual blessings. It is already yours. Say, it's mine. I'm setting you up right now before I minister to you. The word lay hold, I want to give you this very quickly. It means to seize. I didn't change my message. This is still driving out your enemies, smiting your eyes, and you must lay hold of the sword of the word. And the Bible says you have to fight the good fight. And the fight is not, Jesus already completed it. The fight is you must choose to believe. You cannot sit back, pat, well, if God wants to, he will, whatever. That's the wrong posture. And I'm telling you, you sit like that today, you receive nothing. I said you'll receive nothing. But the fight is what? Lay hold. The good fight is to lay hold of eternal life. Fight to grab it. Fight to seize it. Reach your hand out by faith and say, it's mine. Get off, devil. You can't convince me out of it. Shut up. I'm taking my healing today. Jesus already gave it to me. Shut your mouth. That's the battle. The word seize means to apprehend, to arrest with authority, to capture, to catch it, to detain what's yours, even to imprison, incarcerate. It literally means to take into custody. See, police do something called search and seizure. If something has been illegally confiscated or there's illegal activity, police get warrants, they do searches and seizures. Boom. What do they do? They confiscate and seize all property. Cars, name it. It's pretty much seized. The Bible says, lay hold, seize. Do a search and seizure 
on anything Satan has taken from you illegally and lay hold of it with the warrant of the Word of God and take it back. Come on, stand to your feet all over this room right now. If you're here, you never made Jesus the Lord of your life. And you want to pray very quickly, put your hand up. We'll pray right in your chair. You don't have to come up here. We're going to pray. I see that hand in Jesus' name. I see that. Praise the Lord. Look at this. I saw a hand in the back. Everyone, come on. Let's pray this prayer together. I want all of you, let's pray very quickly. Because every one of you are going to receive today. But the greatest miracle is salvation. Say, Father God. Come on louder. Father God. In the name of Jesus. I repent of my sin. I believe Jesus died on the cross, was raised again on the third day, and is seated at the right hand of God. Today I confess, I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth publicly, Jesus is my only Lord and Savior. Say, Satan, I renounce you every idol all occultism that I've indulged in, I renounce it in the name of Jesus. Say unforgiveness, I renounce it. Offense, I renounce it. Say Father God, cleanse me with the blood of your Son. Say I believe Jesus is Lord and he is coming again one day. And my name now is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, everyone shout amen. Come on, put your hands together and bless those who've prayed. Mark that on this card, y'all, who prayed and turn it in. Here's what we're going to do now. Here's what we're going to do. First, I want to minister to the people who are dealing 